lost his citizenship and was exiled from the state. We don't do things like lying now. And maybe because we have these masses of conflicts, masses of chaos, masses of unmatched and unmattered art and architecture, we're in the trouble that we're in. Because we simply do not pay any attention to the effect of our environment upon ourselves. We think if we can get everybody into a house or get all the children into school, we have it made. But unless we put them in a house that is worthy of them and put them in from this school to a better one, nothing is actually solved. So all in, the, all, in all in all, beauty continues to be very important in our daily living. It is something that we all could, must consider to be an aspect of the divine nature. Now we can go into beauty to some other aspects of life. We can go into beauty as it affect upon our personal relations and our personal integrities with each other. We can also go into the problem of nutrition. The nutrition is an art and it is beautiful, the individual as well. If it isn't beautiful, he is sick. If he abuses his own body, he will suffer. If he perverts the lives of others, he will be penalized. All in all, beauty must have its final victory. Now how are you going to find, uh, for average persons, something that might help to make this victory reasonable? Well, I think the ancients all agree on one thing. That the most perfect example of the divine plan that we can contemplate is the very world we live in. The earth with all its glories and all its beauties is the wonder of wonders. No artist can ever make the equal. No great magician can ever bring about the miracle of life. We are constantly surrounded by evidences of a wonderful carefulness, a wonderful integrity, and a magnificent fulfillment of the purpose for which life is fashioned. So if we are observing, we can find beauty in nature. Perhaps in a vacation, we can do a hike into the hills. Perhaps we can go out for a little while simply and sit in a garden and watch the wonders of a handful of plants that have survived all the terrors and tyrannies of mankind. We can also watch and see how harmless things become the basis of great courage and great insights and great improvements. We can also observe the terror that comes from destroying life. We can take a little garden that's not over ten feet square and in it we can build a universe and we can make this a horrible place like an inferno or we can make it a beautiful place where a few little sacred lives are able to fulfill their destinies. Everywhere there is a possibility of a very quiet, beautiful, charming acceptance of the challenge of the soul that all things should be better. Now we have souls, we must realize that bodies uh, have certain proximate relationships but that souls and without being in such relationships are really closer to each other than bodies can ever be. For actually the soul is the point of junction between. Unless the soul blesses a friendship, that friendship will not live. And that friendship cannot survive the corruptions of the various aspects of consciousness. It cannot survive too much selfishness, too much discord, too much deceit. Little by little, the mistakes we make take away from us the kinship with that part of ourselves which is in another body. One of the Greeks referred to a friend of his as himself in, a, in another flesh. And this is the idea almost. Because if things are done perfectly or done nobly or, the, or ideals are preserved, friendships become eternal. And the famous friendship of Damon and Pythias is probably one of the great stories of life. There used to be an order of the Knights of Pythias in which this was dramatized as a part of a, a modern social benevolent organization. But in the story of Damon and Pythias, uh, one man stood for the prostate to the other. The other man went, had to go home to take care of something. They had both been sentenced to death. And the one who had to go was released only on the grounds that the other one would stay. And if the first one never came back, 
the second one would be executed. It looked for a while as though the execution of the second man was inevitable. But on the very day when he was being prepared for death, the first man came back and took on the burden he'd promised, as he had promised. And the ruler of the country was so impressed by this act that he forgave them both. This is the type of thing that, again, is an evidence of something inside of us. Something the story goes on and on and on, of there being something inside that is very important. The Oriental mind also believes that there's something inside of other kingdoms that can be brought into harmony with man. That, the, uh, that all animals, if they are properly tended, will gra gradually verge towards harmlessness. And that practically all animals have the possibility of psychic communion with human beings. And that all this, all the animal it does is grow from the contact. Whereas very often the human being fails because of that contact. It's easy enough for the animal to grow under proper conditions but it is hard to prevent the human being from destroying animals. <clears throat> so we have all these different things to think about. But out of it all comes the one major consideration that each of us has locked within himself the possibility of eternal friendship with all that lives. Also a, a relationship by which there is always a brotherhood of existence that things are never really separated except by appearance. But the real separations we suffer from are the selfishness, the bigotries, and the self-centeredness that we develop in our journey through life. Therefore, if we are going to try now, as we should all be doing, to live better, have a more normal and more kinder relationship, we can start now. Now, the beauty also goes into another phase. And that is <clears throat> the beauty that comes from the creation of life. The most, most important moment, probably, in the experience of beauty is a mother holding in her arms a newborn babe. For her, at that moment, the soul is open. For that moment, all else is forgotten in a simple affection. As time goes on, this may wear off. As the child grows, it may develop strange tendencies that are not pleasant to the mother. But in that moment of birth, a new life comes in. And in that new life, there is a kindred between the soul in that mother and the dawning soul in that child. So every mother has at least once in a lifetime, if she has children, an experience of what you might term the experience of pure harmony and beauty. The little one is beauty and at that time none of its faults and failings will be noticed. None of the limitations it brings will be cared about. In those moments life and life meet in the experience of a magnificent friendship, a fraternity deeper than anything else that can occur in life. So there is the opportunity for every woman to know the meaning of actual uh, beauty. A beauty that has nothing to do with the physical form primarily, but is a meeting of souls, one with the responsibility of caring for the other. And this responsibility becomes the greatest privilege of all. This, greater, this is the one thing that makes the, the life otherwise sterile, suddenly fruitful of all good. So these things we have to watch all the time. For everywhere there is beauty. And this beauty we must all learn to understand. Looking out upon the wastes of deserts, we see what man does to the beauties of the earth. Little by little he corrupts them. He destroys the beautiful valleys and puts factories in their places. He destroys the wonderful mountains and digs out of them the metals he uses to make atomic bombs. Everywhere man is untrue to the earth. He does not cherish, he does not love the earth mother as he should. He does not realize that he is blessed in being able to live upon the surface of the bounty of the infinite. And that if he behaved himself and regarded his life properly, 
he could have all that he needs as long as he lives. But selfishness, cupidity, conflicts creep in, and little by little, the earth that should be a magnificent garden becomes another phase of punishment. So it's therefore everywhere we can we should be trying to release ourselves from the misuse of our own possessions, the misrepresentation of our own ideas, and the gradual corruption of policies that as they go, take with them all that is worth living for and leave nothing behind. In the next few months, maybe a year or two, we're going to have some very important decisions we're going to have to make socially. We're going to have to face the difficulties arising from the exhaustion of resources available for corruption. We are going to realize that we cannot corrupt more without bringing down the whole structure. That we have gone as far as wit can go and it is time for wisdom to come in. We have gone as far as our skill can take us and now what we need is our heart to lead us. Out of all of this there must come a tremendous sense of beauty, a tremendous sense of release of consciousness. It is time for us to develop the mystery of finding the higher sense for our souls. Unless we do, we are going to bring down to ruin one of the most wonderful structures that nature has ever produced. We are just part of a great system. We cannot break the rules of the system without suffering. Now today we are looking for answers, but these answers can never succeed unless these answers are accepted by individuals. Laws can never make us perfect. Legislation can never heal the wounds of crime. The only thing that can bring peace to this world is the release of soul power. The power within the individual to learn, to forget, and to forgive. These have to be there. And out of this regeneration of motives, this reorganization of principles, this redemption of a way of life, we can go into the new century with peace and security. But if we do not make these adjustments, we will go on and on until finally the waters of oblivion close over the great mistake which we have called humanity. And there's no reason it has to be a mistake. It is being tested always. And as long as there is one big grain of hope left, nature will work with us. Nature can t take a little more, take a little more punishment. It can make a few more adjustments. But unless the, the motion towards solution begins to appear, and unless we stop trying to build upon something that is itself soulless, we will be in trouble. The school teacher has a conscience and also has a wonderful psychic integration as all of us have. The school teacher has a soul, but the system will not permit that soul. And if the school teacher tries to teach, it will lose its job. If the individual who tries to do an honest day's work succeeds, they will probably be penalized by the union. Whatever happens, the way we live now, we have created a system of despotism which prevents us from the expression of our own integrity. But in the deeper is something that cannot die. As Paracelsus pointed out, the elixir of transmutation within each person is the power to transmute every mistake he makes into soul power. In the society, there is a possibility that every nation that has done it badly can by a transmutation, a mystery of uh, t transformation, can take the evils and the mistakes and change them into soul growth. We grow by our mistakes, but we have to recognize these mistakes and prevent ourselves from continuing them forever. If we do it right, do it beautifully, and do it quite kindly, we will come out all right. But in the meantime, there's a possibility of everybody having a little fun out of it. There are things we can do that will be pleasant for us. We can find new joys with our children. We don't have to wonder what they're doing. If, if, if we continue as we do now, we'll never find out what they're doing. They will destroy themselves and others. Everywhere there is a need for a restoration of integrity. The churches are attempting it. There's no question about that. The churches are making several adjustments. 
they're beginning to think in terms of a church that looks like a church and that's the first step the second thing is good church music actually there is more religion in an old fashioned hymn than there is in all of the modern sophisticated music one of the reasons being the old hymn they all know they all sing it together and it reminds them all of days that were better these things are very important they help the soul to be free but to be free it must unite with other souls it must share with them they must sing together work together play together and if necessary die together but in all these experiences soul growth continues this beautiful golden light inside of ourselves this wonderful star of eternal salvation that shines in our own hearts will never go down and never disappear as long as we try as long as we make every effort we can to improve to grow to share and to create a better world as long as we make these efforts things will go better and they are coming now i can see every day the more and more the, the discouragement that is in the minds and hearts of those who are failing i can see the discouragement in the minds of the legislators who are trying and knowing before they start that they cannot succeed by the forces they are taking there is no way in which the present problem can be solved without integrity and there is no way in which we can share integrity until it comes through the people and not to them it must be part of a new program of recognizing once more the joy of the family the joy of good friendship the joy of firm and permanent marriages the firm and the of children who love their parents all the superficial things will work out all right if we get a few of the major principles firmly in our consciousness keep them there and live them every day to the best of our ability thank you